Boy, I, uh, I love the words of that hymn. It's one of my favorites. And that last line, that, that God's love, right, demands my life, my soul, my all. We've been talking about the fact that God has placed a call on our lives, right? He has called you to know Him, right? And He has invited every single one of you to know Him personally, relationally. Even though He is a holy God who dwells in unapproachable light, He has made Himself known and approachable throughout history, but most specifically through sending His Son Jesus to us and for us. And not only did, did God reveal Himself to us, but He made Himself available to us. And anyone and everyone can come to God through Jesus Christ and be forgiven of their sin, to be born again into a living hope where you have a living relationship with God now and forever for all of eternity. And in light of that, He has called you to know Him, to experience a relationship with Him, to worship Him, to obey Him, to serve Him, and to follow Him with your life. And so we're looking at Moses and to see God's call in his life and to consider our own call. And we left Moses yesterday uh, struggling and wrestling with, with God's call in his life. And Moses really, really didn't want to do what God was asking him to do. And, I, and as we've seen, it, I don't think it was in any way because he didn't want God to deliver his people or even that he didn't want to be used. But he was intimidated and insecure and overwhelmed. He thought, life has passed me by and it's too late for me. I can't do this. It's been too long. And you know, when we're intimidated or insecure, it can hold us back. And, and so God, God keeps reaching out to Moses. He keeps, he keeps revealing himself and showing himself. And Moses is going to go. Right? God gives him the concession that his brother will get to come with him. And so he is going to go. And today we're going to see how that all starts to unfold. And what we're going to do, we're going to be in Exodus 4 and 5 for a little bit. And, and we're going to go rather quickly uh, through some of this part because I want us to spend some time as well in Psalm 13 this morning, which is a Psalm of David that, that really fits very well with what we're going to see Moses ex experiencing, David experiencing, and what you and I have probably also experienced or may be experiencing right now. And as we do that, we realize that following God's call in our life doesn't always look the way we think it's going to look. You know, sometimes when we get to that place where we even do say yes to God, we have a, a vision or an imagination of, of this is how it will look or this is how it will feel when I say yes to God. And, and as Moses is, is going to encounter that, we realize that Moses probably was at a place where he just wanted life to be safe and predictable. Right? How many of you would say safe and predictable sounds pretty good. Right? And so many times we crave safe and predictable. But following God will not always be safe. And following God will definitely not always be predictable. Jesus said this, just you can see it on the screen, you don't have to turn there. But Jesus said this about following him. He said, whoever does not take up their cross, right, a willingness to, to die, right, to take up your cross was to go to your death and follow me, is not worthy of me. And whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Jesus invites you to trust Him completely. Right? And as we sang earlier, it's based, he, he says, when I ask you to trust me, I'm asking you to trust me based on the love that I have demonstrated to you. Right? The grace that I've given to you in Christ. But when we say yes to God, and when we choose to follow him, it will not always look like we expect. So let's begin uh, in, in Exodus uh, chapter 4. And I'm just going to summarize a little bit from verses 18 through, through 28. Moses is still hesitant, but he goes to his father-in-law and he asks permission to leave and to go visit his family. He doesn't even fully disclose to his father-in-law what God has spoken to him. And I mean, I can identify that with that because when, I, when God called me here at Chehi to, to ministry and to serve him and to say yes to him, I didn't tell anyone for over a year. Right? I didn't fully surrender it for three years. And so Jethro is sensing, I believe, that God is doing something. And he, he speaks a word over Moses and he says, Moses, Pharaoh, the Pharaoh who wanted you dead is dead. Go in peace, 
right? God gave him a word to speak over Moses. Moses took the staff of God. He meets up with his brother Aaron. And then let's pick up in, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 29, uh, and, and, and read a little bit. It says, Moses and Aaron brought together all of the elders of the Israelites. So they have gone. He's gone back to Egypt, and they gather the leaders of the Hebrew people, the Israelites. And Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. So just as uh, God had allowed Aaron to go with him, and, and Moses is like, yep, Aaron, you got this. You can do the talking. And so Aaron speaks, and he also performed the signs before the people, right? The, the signs of the staff turning into a snake and, and, and the hand becoming leprous and clean. And it says in verse 31, they believed. Remember what Moses was so worried about? What was he so worried about when God called him? He says, Moses was so worried that they won't what? Believe me. Remember, he says, they won't believe that you've sent me, but they do believe. They believed him. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. And so things are off to a really good start, right? And we might think, wow, all we have to do is say yes to God, right? And when we say yes to God, and when we step out in faith and we step through our insecurities and we get over our intimidation, that God's, it's just going to be amazing, right? Everything will fall into place. It'll be beautiful and wonderful. Moses might have even been thinking, man, what was I worried about? Ah, so crazy. This is going so well. They've believed me. They're rejoicing that God has seen their misery and their suffering that he is a God who sees, and they bow down and they worship God. But notice what's going to happen next, Exodus chapter 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. And so they go to Pharaoh, and they make a very bold request. But notice verse 2. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh? Who is this God? I am, I've never heard of him. Don't know him. And who, should, who is he that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Now we know from history that, that this Pharaoh would have likely not just seen himself as the leader of Egypt, but as a God himself. And so he is not interested in the Hebrews' God, and he is not willing to listen to him. So they said to him in verse 3, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. And so Moses has, and Aaron have gone to Pharaoh, they've made a request, and Pharaoh has given them a big, fat no. Absolutely not. Now, if you'll remember from the story, right, God, and even in the little passage that we summarized and it pointed out, God had told Moses that Pharaoh will not what? Somebody help me out. He won't listen, right? God told him that it would not happen right away. God said, Pharaoh's heart will be hard, and he will not listen to you right away, but I will, through you, deliver my people. So Pharaoh decides that because of this, and because of this interruption, and to tamp down this potential insurrection, he's going to make life worse for the Hebrew slaves. Right? Life was already miserable for them. Right? Life was, they were living, they were in forced labor. Right? They, they were worked to the point of exhaustion already, right? They are slaves. And now Pharaoh's going to make life more difficult for them. He's going to take away one of the materials, the straw, that they use to make bricks. And he's going to make sure that they still maintain their same quota. And so life has gotten worse for the Hebrew people, right? Moses and Aaron have shown up and they said, God has spoken to us. He's given us these miraculous signs. He's going to set us free from Pharaoh. And they believed Moses. And they worshiped God, but then things don't go the way they thought they would. Notice verse 20 of Exodus chapter 5. 
So the, the Hebrew leaders, the foremen, the, the leaders of the work crew have gone to Pharaoh themselves because they said, this is unsustainable. We, we, can't, we can't keep up this pace. This is, this is, you're, you're killing us. And Pharaoh says, not my problem. So when they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. May the Lord look on you and judge you. Right? They, they, this is not something nice that they're saying to Moses and Aaron. Are you with me? Like, like may God judge you. May God punish you. you, you this, is, this is all wrong. They said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. Why? Because you have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh. And his officials have put a sword in their hand to kill us. They're like, Moses, man, maybe you just had some crazy delusion out there in the desert. You know, you used to be the prince of Egypt, and you used to be one who thought you'd deliver us, but you've been out with the sheep too long, and maybe you were just too hot in the sun, because I don't think you really heard from God. Because if you had heard from God and he was going to deliver us, then our suffering wouldn't be worse. Our pain wouldn't be more difficult. God, may God judge you. You've, you've made it worse. And for Moses, this is going to be a very dark time. Now, for those of us that are familiar with this story, we know what God is going to do. And we know God's going to do something incredible. But Moses doesn't know that yet. He doesn't know how it's going to unfold. The people don't know. And so notice what Moses says in verse 22. Then Moses turned to the Lord. And he said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people. Why did you ever send me? God, why? Why have you why haven't why have you made it worse for them? And God, why did you even send me? And I, I can imagine Moses thinking, didn't I tell you this wasn't a good idea? Remember, God, I said I didn't want to go. Why didn't you listen to me? Verse 23. For since I came to Pharaoh, to speak in your name. He has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Moses is, Moses is in a dark place. He's hurting. Even though God said Pharaoh's heart will be hard, and he won't let his people go right away, I don't think Moses thought it was going to get worse. It was already bad. And now it's worse. And Moses is thinking, saying yes to God, I didn't think it would look like this. I didn't think it would feel like this. And so he is accusing God. He says, God, why have you done evil? Why did you send me? And then this very direct accusation in verse 23, you have not delivered your people at all. The people of Israel are in a dark place. Their life has been bad and now it's worse. Moses is in a dark place and he's wrestling with that. God, why? And maybe you can identify with that because maybe you have been in a situation or maybe you are there right now where you say, I know what that feels like. God, why? Why have you allowed this to happen? God, why did you allow this person to be taken far too soon? God, why did you allow this sickness, this cancer? Why did you allow that person to do this to me? Why did you allow my parents to get divorced? Why did you allow that thing not to go the way that I thought it would. I've been trying to follow you. I'm trying to say yes to you. I've been praying, God, why? Right, we all get to that place. And Moses is in a place of saying, God, why? Now he is right. He is right to bring his emotions to God. Right, God has given us emotions. We are emotional people. And part of our, the reason that we have emotions is that we are made in the image of God. God also has emotions. We are made to feel. But because our feelings are limited to creation and to the fall and to sin, right, our feelings are not always the thing that we should follow or trust, right? You, can you imagine if you made every decision in life based on your feelings, right? A lot of you would still be in bed right now. Are you with me? But our feelings are good. Right? They're part of who we are. And God wants us to bring our feelings to Him. Even our anger, our frustration. Right? You can bring that to God. He can handle your emotions. And He can handle your frustrations. And He can handle it even when you're frustrated with Him. But He was wrong to forget God's promises. 
It was right for him to express his heart to God. But it was wrong for him to have forgotten God's promises. And so I want us to, to, to think about what do we do? What do we do when we find ourselves in dark places? Right? Moses is in a dark place. So what do we do when we're in that place? You know, it's easy to want to rush to the good part of the story. Any of you, sort of when you're reading, you want to rush to the good part? Right? You want to get to the good part. And, and, and it would be easy for us to, in the story of Moses, just to rush through this and get to the good parts. God's going to do some incredible things. But I think it's wise for us to linger here for a few moments. Because following God's call in our life does not mean that we will always be safe. It doesn't mean that things will always be easy. It doesn't mean that you'll always be understood or accepted or loved. Right? And Moses is a discovering this. And he's struggling. And he's wrestling. God, why? God's going to answer. God's going to do extraordinary things. But Moses can't see it in this moment. And I think if we could put ourselves in his sandals for a moment. Are you with me? You know, one of the things I've learned in life and am learning in life is that it is good to put ourselves in other people's shoes, or in this case, sandals, right? And to see it from their perspective. He's in a dark place. Listen, I, I know, I know dark places. I've been there myself. Seven years ago, I went through a forced resignation in the church that I was serving, and it was a very, very difficult time. But I can look back and say God was faithful even in the dark. I went through a major battle with anxiety three, three and a half years ago. I know what it's like to be in a place where your mind isn't doing what you want it to do or what you know it should do. I know what it's like to be there. And you know what it's like to be there. And, and your experiences are different than mine and our dark places. We're not to compare them because they're, they're different. But I, I want to give you three things that you can do in the dark. Three things that you can do when you are in a dark place. Number one, you can pray. Number one, you can pray. And what I want us to do is to just look very, very briefly at Psalm 13. Because David, right, the man after God's own heart, right, the slayer of Goliath, the builder of the temple, the king of Israel, gifted musician, mighty warrior, but also a man who wrestled with depression and loneliness and questions. And so Psalm 13, as we think about the thing that I can do and the things that I can do when I'm in the dark, number one is to pray. I can pray. Let, let's look at Psalm 13 and, and verses 1 through 4. David says, how long, Lord? How long is this going to last? Lord, will you forget me forever? Right? David says, I, I feel like you've forgotten me. I, I'm, not, I'm not sensing your presence. I don't feel like you're answering my prayers. How long will you hide your face from me? Right? David says, you're hiding from me. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day and have sorrow in my heart? How many of you know, say, I know the wrestling of the thoughts, right? The wrestling in our minds. David says, my mind is racing and it's wrestling. I'm in sorrow. He says, how long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. God, if you don't help me and if you don't illuminate the darkness of my soul, the depression that I'm in, God, I'm going to die. I I'm not going to make it. He says, I'm going to sleep in death if you don't show up. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. When you are in a dark place, you need to pray. And to pray with emotion, to pray with passion, to, to pour out your heart before God. Notice Psalm 62, verse 8. It says to trust in Him at all times, even in the dark. Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him, for God is a refuge for us. Listen, when you're in a dark place, or if you're in a dark place right now, I want to invite you to just go to God. And even you say, well, I'm angry at God. I'm frustrated with God. I don't even know if I believe in God anymore. Just call out to Him. It's okay. Just say, God, if you're there, if you're listening, if you're real, here's my heart. I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm confused. I'm overwhelmed. But God, if you're real, I need you. I need your power. I need your grace. I need your help. 
call out to him. Number two, in the dark you can trust God. In the dark you can choose to trust God. Psalm 13 verse 5, David goes on. He says, but, but I have trusted in your steadfast love and my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Now remember, nothing's changed. David's still in the dark. He's still mired in suffering and depression. But he says, I have trusted in your steadfast love. I know you love me. You've shown your love to me. You've shown your faithfulness to me. And even though I don't feel it, sense it, or experience it right now, I trust it. And so in the dark, we have to cling to God's promises by faith. And to say, I don't feel it right now. I'm, I'm struggling right now. But God, you said, and so I will believe. And you know, as we sang about this morning, the, the number one promise that, that I run back to when I'm in the dark is that God sent His Son into this world. And that Jesus willingly came to this world and He lived for me. And He willingly went to the cross for me and He suffered for me. And He experienced loneliness and rejection and pain and agony. He experienced what it was like to be mocked and made fun of, spit on and slapped. He experienced what it was like to be betrayed by one of the people that, that he was closest to. He knew what it was like to feel the pain of Peter, his closest disciple, the hours before his death, swear to God that he didn't even know who he was. Can you imagine the pain that Jesus felt? Listen, Jesus knows your pain. He is a man of sorrows who is acquainted with the bitterest of suffering. And He identifies with our pain. And He identifies with our, our suffering. And so when we look at the cross, we can say, I can trust God because He knows what suffering is. And He understands. Listen, I won't ever fully understand the things you experience in life. And you might not fully ever understand the things I experience in life. But there is a God in heaven who does. And He loves you and He cares. And so trust Him. Even in the dark, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, the one who calls you is faithful, he will do it. So keep trusting him. And number three, worship. Worship. It sometimes seems like the most counterintuitive thing to do when we're suffering, struggling, when we're depressed or anxious, or when we're doubting God. But I have learned that not only is this true, but it's powerful. That in the valley... And in the dark, God calls us to praise Him. And there's something so powerful about singing and worshiping God. And listen, worship is more than singing. Worship is way more than music. But music and singing is a powerful, powerful part of our worship to God. Over and over in the Scriptures, we're commanded to sing. And I found that when I choose to worship God, even in the dark and even in the valley, that it does something to me. You know, sometimes just when we're at sing, I love sing time. Anybody else love sing time? Man, and I don't know, but maybe it's just because it's been two years, but I feel like this week, is, they've been so good. I've appreciated your testimonies. I've really appreciated the, the hymns that you've selected. They've been powerful. And they remind us about the truths of who God is. They give us opportunities to express those things and to point us to the hope that we have in Christ. Notice Psalm 13, verse 6. David says this, and again, this is in the same psalm where he's saying, how long will you forget me, God? And how long are you going to hide your face? And I'm going to die if you don't help me. And then he says this, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Right? He was able to proclaim that even in the dark. He says, I will sing to the Lord. Praise is so powerful. And our real worship I believe the truest test of our worship is not our praise on the mountaintop. Right? And God gives us mountaintop moments in life. Moments where we feel like we can see things clearly. We experience God so sweetly and dearly. Right? And those mountaintop moments are important. And, and I, I hope that in some ways Chehi will be a mountaintop place for you. Right? A place where you can come up as Moses want, will do in not too far distant future to go up on the mountain and meet with God. And, you know, and sometimes we want, to stay, we want to stay on the mountain, don't we? Right? There's a part, and we couldn't physically stay here forever because we would die of exhaustion, right? But, but it would be good to just stay here. But God's going to allow us to go from the mountain sometimes to the valley. And in the valley, God's going to want you to remember that what He showed you on the mountain is still true. It hasn't changed. And when we praise Him in the valley, when we praise Him not because things are going well or we feel well, 
or we're happy, but we praise him because he's worthy and he's good, it changes us. And so I want to invite you and challenge you to worship God even in the darkness, even in the difficulty. God's about to do something unimaginable in and through Moses. God's going to work powerfully on behalf of his people. God's going to be faithful to his promises and to his people. But right now it's dark. And so when you're in a dark place, and life will sometimes bring us to dark places. I know some of you are there right now. And so I want you to just remember these three words. Pray, trust, and worship. Go to Psalm 13 and pray through it with David. And I believe that when you do these things, the darkness might not go away right away. The problem might not get better right away. But you will experience something even more amazing than God changing your circumstance. You will experience the living God meeting you, sustaining you, strengthening you, carrying you, holding you up. And so I want to encourage you when you're in the dark to do these three things. And then I want to encourage you to do one more thing. It's not specifically in Psalm 13, but it's important. I want to encourage you to reach out. Listen, when you're in the dark, you need to reach out. God has given us each other. Right? We are a body. We weren't made to live life alone. We weren't made to live the Christian life alone. And there are times where you're just going to need to invite somebody in and say, I'm in a dark place and, and I want to pray and I want to trust and I want to worship, but I don't even feel like I can. And God can bring someone to your life and say, I'll pray for you. I'll trust for you. I will worship for you. Right? I know, I know in some of my darkest moments where I didn't even know what to pray and sometimes God would just prompt a friend to call me and pray for me. I can remember one very distinct moment one of my best friends, he called me up and he prayed and I remember thinking, I didn't know you could pray like that. And God ministered to me. So when you're in a dark place, reach out. You are in a perfect place here to reach out. There are people here that love you, your counselors, your faculty, myself, right? Our staff, they love you, they care about you. And if you're in a dark place or you're struggling, no one's going to judge you or look down on you. They all understand and we'll walk beside you. We'll make sure that you have help lined up if you need it at home. Whatever we can do, right, to help you through those dark dark places. I want to leave you with a quote from Corrie ten Boom. Uh, Corrie and her family lived in Holland. Uh, they became famous uh, in the World War II era, in the Nazi regime, for hiding, hiding people uh, who were being persecuted and killed by the Germans. And eventually her family was caught and she was sent to a concentration camp where she suffered immensely. Her sister there with her died in that concentration camp, but she was delivered and she get to share her stories. But she's, she left us with this quote. She says, With Jesus, even in our darkest moments, the best remains. And the very best is yet to be. And so when you're in the dark, just know this. The darkness will not last forever. God will bring you through. And one day he will bring you to himself. And there will never be darkness again. Let's pray. Father, my heart is burdened because I know there are people in this room who are in a dark place. And Father, I pray that you would reach into their life with your inexplainable light and mercy and grace and reveal yourself to them. And Father, I pray that you would give them the faith to pray, to trust, and to worship. I get, pray that you'd give them the courage to reach out and to talk to someone. And Father, I pray for those that will be in a dark place, that they would remember these things, that I would remember these things. And Father, I thank you that you are a faithful God and that you bring us through the dark places and that you have purpose for the darkness that we sometimes don't understand and that you care about our suffering. And Father, I also thank you that one day, sooner than we think, we will see you face to face. And in that day, there will be no more darkness, only light. So Father, help us to remember that and to take comfort in that and to be filled with hope because of that. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.